In the peaceful town of Grand Forks, North Dakota, a chilling mystery began to unfold on an ordinary November day in 2003. Drews Joden, a vibrant young woman known for her compassion and community service, disappeared without a trace after leaving her job at Victoria's Secret. What followed was a harrowing journey through cryptic phone calls, shocking discoveries, and a relentless pursuit of truth and justice. Drew, a vibrant and ambitious 22-year-old, had her roots deeply entwined with the town. She balanced her life as a student at the University of North Dakota, majoring in visual art with a part-time job at Victoria's Secret. But there was much more to Drew than just her academic pursuits and work. She was a unique blend of creativity and compassion. Her love for art knew no bounds, and she expressed herself through various forms, from sketching to painting, to capturing the world's beauty through her lens. Yet, it was her unwavering commitment to helping others that truly set her apart. Affectionately known as Doodles in her younger years, Drew's heart was as big as her dreams. She was an athlete who enjoyed sports like volleyball and golf but it was her volunteer work that showcased her exceptional spirit. She dedicated her time to underprivileged children, organizing bowling outings and teaching them the joys of reading. She also channeled her energies into fundraising for organizations like the American Diabetes Association, leaving an indelible mark on her community. On that Saturday, November 22, Drew finished her shift at Victoria's Secret at 4 p.m., her vibrant spirit undiminished Little did she know that her workplace, a stepping stone towards her dreams, would soon become the backdrop for an unfolding mystery. Drew had her sights set on an upcoming adventure, a trip to Australia in the spring of 2004. Each paycheck brought her closer to her dream. As the clock struck 5 p.m. Drew, with a purse she'd found in tow, left the mall and began her walk towards her car. It seemed like an ordinary end to a day, but fate had other plans in store. Unknown to her, the next moments would be shrouded in uncertainty, setting off a chain of events that would captivate an entire community. As Drew approached her car, little did she know that her life was about to take a chilling turn into the realm of the unknown. She was due for work that evening, but when she didn't show up for her shift, concern began to ripple through her circle of friends and colleagues. It was out of character for Drew to miss work without notice, and her absence sent alarm bells ringing. Drew's boyfriend, Chris Lang, became one of the first to realize that something was amiss. He told the police that he hadn't seen her that afternoon, but he did receive a phone call from her shortly after she left the mall at 5 p.m. The conversation ended abruptly, leaving him with an unsettling feeling. In the background, he heard Drew utter the words, Okay. Okay. Then, the call abruptly disconnected. At the time, he didn't think much of it, assuming it was just a dropped call. But as evening turned into night, and there was still no sign of Drew, worry transformed into fear. At 7.42 p.m. that same night, Chris received another call from her phone. This time, all he heard was static and the sound of someone fumbling with the buttons on the phone. It was far from reassuring. The alarm bells grew louder, and the police swung into action. They began searching the parking lot, where Drew's car was still parked outside the mall. What they discovered sent shivers down their spines. A knife sheath was found beside her car. The grim possibility of an abduction loomed large. Desperation mounted, and the police reached out to Drew's phone service provider, hoping for a lead. The information they received was both puzzling and troubling. Drew's phone had pinged off a cell tower near Crookston, Minnesota, suggesting she had been taken across state lines. What had begun as a normal day for Drew had now become a perplexing and ominous mystery. The search for Drew, spearheaded by volunteers and law enforcement alike, was a testament to the unwavering determination of the community. Fields and forests were scoured, every lead followed diligently, but the young woman remained elusive. Then, a chilling discovery sent shockwaves through the investigation. Three days after her disappearance, 
One of Drew's shoes was found near a bypass road close to Crookston, Minnesota. The proximity to the location where her phone had last pinged only deepened the sense of foreboding. It was a cruel reminder that Drew had been in this area, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance grew ever more puzzling. The atmosphere in Grand Forks grew heavier with each passing day. Hope was still there, but it was fragile, like a flickering candle in the gathering darkness. Drew's family, friends, and the entire community clung to the belief that she would be found safe and sound. But it was during this time that the investigation took a dark and unsettling turn. The police received a tip from a vigilant member of the public, pointing them towards a man named Alfonso Rodriguez Jr., who resided in the area and had been in Grand Forks the day Drew went missing. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr.'s background sent shockwaves through law enforcement. He had been released from prison just six months earlier and was living with his mother in Crookston. What was even more disturbing was his classification as a level three sex offender, the highest risk category, with a chilling history of serving 23 years in prison for multiple rapes and an attempted rape. The police wasted no time in contacting Alfonso. He confessed to being in Grand Forks on the 22nd of November, even claiming he had visited the same mall where Drew worked. However, his story began to unravel under scrutiny. When questioned about the movie he had supposedly watched in the mall's theater, once upon a time in Mexico, the theater's records and local listings contradicted his account. The movie hadn't been screened on that day anywhere in Grand Forks. Suspicion continued to mount but it was the evidence found in his possession that sent shockwaves through the investigation. When the police conducted a thorough search of his 2002 Mercury Sable, they unearthed a knife concealed in the trunk. Even more incriminating, they discovered traces of blood on the car's rear window and seat. DNA testing left no room for doubt. It was a match with Drew's DNA. The evidence against Alfonso was undeniable. Yet the most haunting truth remained the whereabouts of Druze Joden. Despite the damning evidence against Alfonso Rodriguez Jr., remained a chilling enigma. Alfonso was arrested and continued to deny that he was responsible for Drew's disappearance. Several months later, specifically on April 17, 2004, a tragic event unfolded when Drew's lifeless body was discovered in a drainage ditch outside of Crookston. The grim scene revealed Drew partially unclothed from the waist down, her hands cruelly bound behind her back, and her lifeless form lying face down. The location where her body was found had been previously searched, but it remained concealed beneath the snow until the thaw revealed the horrific truth. Disturbingly, there were signs of brutality, a rope, and remnants of a plastic grocery bag were discovered around her neck. The autopsy conducted on Drew's body aimed to determine the exact cause of her death. The findings indicated that she may have succumbed to asphyxiation or suffocation, the slash wound to her neck, or exposure to the harsh elements. The gravity of this crime was underscored by the fact that it was alleged that Alfonso had taken Drew across state lines before her tragic demise. Consequently, he faced federal charges, which allowed the prosecution to consider seeking the death penalty, a stance they made unequivocally clear. Throughout the trial, the prosecution contended that there was no room for doubt. Drew had been kidnapped outside the mall, transported across state lines, and ultimately murdered. They also asserted their belief that she had suffered violation. The jury was presented with compelling evidence including a knife found in Alfonso's car and a knife sheath located near Drew's vehicle. DNA analysis further linked Alfonso to the crime, along with the recovery of hair and fiber samples from Drew's body and belongings. Dr. Michael McGee, the medical examiner, played a pivotal role in the courtroom drama. He testified about Drew's injuries and the circumstances surrounding her death. He pointed to two substantial cuts on her neck as the likely cause of her demise. Though he couldn't definitively rule out suffocation or exposure, Dr. McGee's expert opinion 
grounded in his extensive experience and thousands of autopsies, suggested that Drew met a violent end during assault. The condition of her clothing, notably a torn pink sweater and displaced pea coat, hinted at a struggle. The defense's perspective diverged significantly from the prosecution's account. Alfonso had offered to plead guilty to avoid the death penalty, but this offer was declined. The central disputes revolved around whether Drew was raped and the critical question of where she met her fate. The latter would determine the potential imposition of the death penalty. The defense argued that there was insufficient evidence to support a rape allegation and contended that Drew likely perished from suffocation mere minutes after her abduction. Alfonso was ultimately found guilty in federal court of kidnapping, resulting in Drew's death. The jury, after weighing both sides' arguments, unanimously recommended the death penalty, a historic decision for North Dakota, which had not seen a death sentence in nearly a century. The state does not have the death penalty, so it is only considered in federal cases. The sentencing was a heavy moment for Judge Ralph R. Erickson, who acknowledged the gravity of the situation, remarking that it was the worst day of his life. Alfonso's attorneys immediately requested a new trial, but it was denied. They appealed and requested a stay of execution until the appeal was heard. In 2021, the same judge who sentenced Rodriguez to death, Ralph R. Erickson, overturned his sentence and ordered that a new sentencing phase be conducted due to misleading testimony from a medical examiner and limitations on mental health evidence. The testimony in court of Michael McGee, the Ramsey County Medical Examiner, was unreliable, misleading, and inaccurate, and that Rodriguez's attorneys did him a disservice by opting to limit the mental health evaluation of Rodriguez, which could have resulted in the possible use of the insanity. Defense by their client. On March 14, 2023, prosecutors announced that they would no longer seek the death penalty for Rodriguez. Rodriguez was sentenced to life without parole on May 18, 2023.